When I was a kid, and by kid I mean up to about the age of 15, I um, collected Lego. Loved the stuff, loved that you could have a different toy one day, totally new toy the next day, assemble them, pull them apart. Got very excited when new sets came out and new Lego blocks came out. At about the age of 15, I discovered a computer at the local library and I wanted to find some way to be able to get one of these computers. So I sold all of my Lego, it was very sad, and that's what got me started on programming. But I look at building apps very much like building Lego. Um, I'm not a designer, I'm a developer, but I do like to equip designers with things that enable them to give me things I can actually use. So that's the topic. How do we build apps like Lego? So it normally goes something like this. The designer will use something like Azure or Sketch or Pixate uh, to build their prototypes and they'll hand that over. It'll come over to the handover period and we're ready, developers ready, and we completely destroy what they've done. It's completely wasted. Um, all that we get out of it is we disassemble those bits and we look at all the colours and the intent and the markup, try and figure out what they wanted to stretch and so on. And then we recreate the whole thing and stick it in our, um, in our Xcode project. So we need to come up with a way to solve that problem. If we could actually get the designers to use Xcode uh, and equip them with everything that they need to do that, then when they hand over those um, components, then we'll be able to use it. We'll be able to have a bit of a sort of two-way handshake and, oh, look, we need to adjust this, that auto layout's wrong, um, this bit of intent isn't there. And then we have something that we can both use. So we get a copy, they get a copy, we'll use version control, we have an engineering side, we have a layout side. So what's so good about Lego? I mentioned a bit about why I liked it as a kid, but what can we learn from Lego? You see a pile of Lego blocks. What I see is different components that are loosely coupled. Right? You can take any one of those components, attach it to a different one, swap them around and they just work. You can snap them together, uh, you can snap them together one way, you can take them all apart and assemble something completely different. You can change properties, you can change their colour, swap them out, you can change how long it is, swap them out. Surprisingly, Lego already supports multiple resolutions and all size classes. So you can get your sort of basic Lego and you can attach it to Duplo, which is for toddlers, and the two just connect. Right? So when they thought about the engineering of these blocks, they already made them work on all different size classes. And the way that they do that is the person who's using it doesn't have to worry about the inner workings. All they know is that the thing clicks on top and I can assemble stuff. Right? So if we're going to build components that are truly reusable by developers and even designers, then we need to adopt that same sort of philosophy. So let's have a look at a Lego block. A Lego block looks like this. It's got a very easy API. You click one block onto the next block. So how can we apply this to our Xcode components? And just for today, I'm talking about visual components, but the... Uh, sort of philosophy extends to model, view and controller, but today I'm just talking about views. So inside Xcode, we've got at least six uh, APIs that we can use on our view components to make them highly reusable. So we've got attributes, you can set the background colour, you can set the content mode, that sort of thing. Uh, you've got auto layout, so you can make it so just like Lego adapts to different size classes and different sizes of screens, your component will adapt. You've got IB outlet, so you can have your uh, engineering code side of things understand what visual components are there and adjust them. You've got uh, IB actions, so when you tap a button something will happen. You've got IB designable, which means that you can actually see your components with it uh, rendered inside Xcode's interface builder without having to run the project every time. And you've got IB inspectable, which means that you can expose your variables to um, be configured right inside interface builder without having to go into the code. So let's have a look at some of those things. Here's a, a sort of extract of a particular project that I'm working on at the moment with uh, the Combank designers. So they do 
a large part of what I'm about to show you, and I do the engineering side of it. I'm going to start off very slow. Is anyone here a designer? I'm going to try and sell you on the prospect of using Xcode for your design, right? And then I'm going to get uh, rapidly get faster um, and assume that you know all of it because you've had five-minute tutorial. So here's Xcode. I'm going to go into Xcode, make a new storyboard. Now, a storyboard is what we use for uh, doing the flow of an app, the different screens. So I go and make a new storyboard. I give it a name. I'm going to call this one Dashboard because it's going to be the dashboard of my banking app. Um, now, at the moment, there's nothing in there. So I have to drag in a scene. So I'm going to drag in a navigation controller. And a navigation controller, by default, comes with um, its root view controller is a table view. And quite often that's what you want, but in this particular case I don't want that. I'm going to make it um, a generic view controller. Also in Xcode, what am I using here, 7, uh, it defaults to being big squares. So you saw that I changed that to say, just show me what it looks like on an iPhone um, 6, I think I chose. So here's my view controller. I'm now saying you are now my new root view controller. So when I launch this app, it'll come up inside a navigation controller with a navigation bar at the top, and the first scene is what we see there on the right. And at the moment, nothing in it. I'll give it a name. So this is what's going to appear to the customer when they launch the app. I'll replace that later with a nice graphic, but for the moment, that's just a placeholder. And down the bottom in this, I want to have... a a series of, of buttons. And we have six buttons in the ComBank app, so we affectionately refer to that as the six-pack. So I need to define a sort of a, a view in which those buttons can live. So I've dragged in a view. Now I'm going to find a button in my palette of objects, drag in a button, and then I'll just duplicate it across the row, and then I'll duplicate it vertically, so I've got a nice three-by-two matrix. Now, these are all just uh, out-of-the-box Xcode components so far. I haven't done anything with branding or anything where an engineer has had to be involved. Let's have a look at how these are positioned. Now, I've just roughly positioned them at the moment, but as I mentioned, one of the things that we can use with components is auto layout, and we need to figure out where these things are going to lay out as a rule. But they're a bit hard to see because they're white on white, so I find it useful to just go into the attributes and change the background of those, at least temporarily. So I'm going to make the background of those buttons uh, grey with some opacity. Um, I'm going to make them grey with a bit of op uh, lower opacity so you can see through them. Uh, it just makes it a bit easy to see what's going on. And I'm also going to make that view that contains them have a different colour just so I can see that contrast. just makes it a bit easier for me to see what's going on instead of white on white. First thing I want to do is have that entire area that contains the six pack. I need to pin that to the bottom left and right. So here I'm going in and setting the constraints to be zero on the left, the right, and the bottom. And I'm also going to set it to be a, a fixed height, but I'll get back to that. So here we are, it's all red because I haven't given it enough information. I've given it three constraints, but it needs a fourth one to know how high it is. And in this particular case, I'm going to set the height of that pink area to be a proportion of the screen as a whole. So again, this is back to adapting for different screens. So I'm going to make this always one third of the overall screen height. And now I need to take care of the individual buttons. So my intent here is I want a one point gap between all of the buttons. So I'm going to go in here and just select all six buttons, tell them all to be one point separated from their nearest neighbour, and Xcode does the maths and gets rid of redundant um, uh, constraints between, if it's already got the one from the left to the right, it won't also make one from the right to the left. Uh, and, but it's got a problem. It's all come up red again. So it's come up red because I haven't given it enough information. Um, if I've got two buttons side by side and they, I've told them they should be one point apart, that, I haven't told it how big they are. There are several ways that could be accomplished. So that's what's referred to as an ambiguous constraint system. So I'll go in and tell them that they should all be equal widths and equal heights. So that should be enough information for all of the buttons to know where they should go. So here they are. Now it's not red, it's orange. So orange indicates I have enough rules, but I'm not where I should be. So we can simply go down the bottom here and choose update, update frames to match the constraints. And I'll choose the bottom one, which will affect everything there. So now it's all blue. So blue is happy. The next thing I want to do is 
uh, customize each of these buttons. So I need to give them all uh, a bit of text as to what the, that particular function is going to be. And you can see immediately that they're not quite right. You can see transfer to your account is too big for the button. So we will have to come back and customize that somehow, but for the moment it's good enough. Uh, I want to have a carousel. I want to have something with features of the app that you can swipe across. So I'm going to put that in as a container. Now, a container brings its own view controller. You can see the arrow that connects the two. Um, and I, I want to put in a special one of those, but at the moment I'm just going to resize this. I'm going to leave a, a gap for a page control in between. And just so I, again I can see what's going on, I'm going to put a temporary colour on the background. So, um, and now I can see my page control as I drag that in. So I've got uh, white there and grey on top. So I'm going to set the um, page control to be centred horizontally. I'm going to pin it to the thing above, pin it to the thing below. Controller on the right that controls the content of that container. It, I've changed that to a collection view controller. And collection view controllers have cells. So you're probably familiar with a collection view controller from the Photos app where you've got all little photos as little things across the screen. But in this, I want it, them to be full screen. So I'm just going to roughly make it full screen. Now, the next thing I want to do is create a background for this app. So this background is going to be used all over the app, and I'm going to add some blurring later and maybe some custom behavior. So I'm going to make that as its own view. So whereas a storyboard you use for the flow of the app, you can make an individual view that might be used throughout the app. So here I am, I've made, I've gone into, um, made a new file, chose view, uh, and it makes what's called a zib, an Xcode interface builder file, or often it's also referred to as nib because before it was apples, this all belonged to next step, and so you'll see nib and zib interchanged along with the word view. So here I'm putting in an image view inside my view, and I'm going to set that image to be one of the images that I've added to the app, and that's going to be my app background, a nice beach scene, because whenever I go to the beach, I think of banking. In order to use that, I want to create a class file to go along with it. So the class file is just some code, right? And in this case, it's just kind of the glue, so that I can refer to something called a background view, and it's going to use that background view zip. So here I am creating the file. So the next thing I want to do is have a uh, view that goes inside that carousel, something that gives a bit of information with the product. So it might be find your nearest ATM, it might be um, your, I don't know, this month's lucky winner of something. No, we don't do that in banking, do we? Um, or it might be uh, take out a home loan with us or some offer like that. So I'm creating another view. So this is a view that, again, is going to be used throughout the app. So I create my view. I'm going to um, uh, get rid of the status icon because I don't need that in my view. I'm going to put in uh, a couple of labels and a couple of buttons and a spot at the top for an icon. And if I go through and set up the constraints for that, so I want it to be pinned to the left and the right, uh, and same with the one above and same with the icon, and then I'm going to apply rules where I pin some and centre some, similar to what I did before. I've also changed the colour again just so I can see temporarily where things are, which I'll get rid of later. The buttons down the bottom they're a little bit interesting because when I um, have those two buttons inside a view, it doesn't have enough information about uh, where it should be. So I'm actually going to have the two Lego blocks or buttons inside that group determine how big that group should be. Now doing this is actually quite easy. All we have to do is select the two buttons that are inside the group and apply pin constraints to the four edges. So we select the two buttons, go down and choose pin, turn on the constraints for the four edges, and then just update the frames. You can see that the red has disappeared, there are enough constraints to determine where each of the buttons should be, and therefore the group that contains them. The width of each button has been determined by the text within it. So let's override that by applying a constraint that sets the two buttons to always have an equal width. Remember the Duplo and the Lego example, we need to make sure that this will uh, adapt to any uh, outer size that it is given. So to do that, we'll set up a constraint between the buttons down here and the first bit of text, and we'll just ensure that the vertical spacing between those two items is always at least uh, eight points. 
so that those two objects won't overlap if this runs on a really small screen like an iPhone 4S. Now we've got our notice view zip for the layout and we've got our notice view class file. We need to tell uh, the outer view of this zip that it is a notice view. So to do that we just simply select that uh, outer view, go into the identity inspector and change the class from the UI view default to notice view. Back in our storyboard we can apply the classes that we've created or put in instances of the uh, Lego blocks that we've created. So we'll put in a UI view which is our, uh, our base class, we'll put that in the cell and we need to change its class to be a notice view. But first we'll just simply constrain it to the left, the top, the bottom and the right and then we'll go and change the, uh, in the identity inspector we'll change the class to notice view. And similarly for the background view that we um, placed in earlier, we'll change that view to be the background view class that we created. Back to our notice view class, in order to tell uh, Xcode that it should render uh, the contents of this notice view in our storyboard instances, we need to add uh, a keyword before the class, which is at IB designable. And similarly, we've done that for the uh, background view. So here we've got our background view zib on the right and we've got the placeholder for it on the left um, but it's not rendering. Similarly if I show the notice view uh, in the storyboard on the left and I show an instant, I show the notice view zib on the right, it's also not rendering in the storyboard. This is a big problem. Uh, we've done everything that we should do. We've made it IB designable, we've created a zip that should be the source of truth for the content of this uh, particular view uh, and we've defined the class uh, on the left in the storyboard that matches notice view but it's just not rendering. It's strange. Apple provides the ability in Xcode to create the zip like we can see on the right and to place an instance of that class in the storyboard on the left but it provides no mechanism for the content of that zib to be displayed in the storyboard either at design time or at runtime. Fortunately we have a tool at our disposal to make this happen and that's called a nib view and a nib view is just a replacement uh, superclass instead of UI view that makes it all just work. All we have to do is go back to our class file. Uh, so let's have a look at the notice view, for instance. And when we define this, we defined it as a superclass. It's superclass as UI view. We simply change that superclass to be nib view, uh, and we need to give the storyboard on the left a bit of a kick, uh, just by changing to a different file and then changing back again. That's enough to force it to re-render, and then the nib view renders. Uh, we've got our notice view rendering in the storyboard from the source of truth of the zib. Similarly, if we do it for the uh, for the background view, we change its superclass to be nib view, then it appears, renders the content in the storyboard. So here we can see in the storyboard uh, an instance of the background view on the left, an instance of the notice view on the right, both getting their content from the uh, zip files that we created earlier. Now that we've got the notice view Lego block defined in the zip, let's create multiple instances of that. So we've already got one here uh, on the left. I'm just going to delete the um, placeholder cell uh, on the right and duplicate the first one. So now I've got two instances of the notice view. Both instances of the notice view are identical. They both get their content from the zip. But what we want to be able to do is customize uh, some of the content, some of the properties inside each instance to make them different from each other, still drawing their source of truth for layout and so on from the zip. So let's have a look at doing that. We switch over to the notice view class. We need some way for the class file, the, the code on the left, to be connected to the individual elements inside the zip view on the right. And of course we do that using IB outlets. We simply hold down control and drag from uh, each of the elements in the zip on the right into our code and give each element a name. 
Xcode writes all of the other code for us, we just simply have to create the name. So here I've chosen to call them text label, detail text label, and icon view. Our storyboard has two instances of the notice view, and we want to change the text of the first one to be a welcome screen. In order to do that, we have to remember that we've just created outlets called text label and detail text label, and for each of those, we need to change the text, or precisely, we need to change this instance's text label dot text to be a particular string value. And to do that, we can go into the uh, runtime attributes for this class. So we'll zoom in, we'll add a key path and we have to know what the key path is and we just define that as being the text label and you are, and it's a label which has a property called text. We'll change the type to be string and we'll give it a value that welcomes people to our app. And as soon as we type that in and hit tab or return, then it appears in our instance. And this instance is different from the other instance. Similarly, we can enter the detail text label dot text and give that some uh, string content. Now the text label and detail text label are UI labels and a UI label has many properties. We've just adjusted the text, uh, but we also have uh, text color and shadow and background color and the font and other things that could be changed. But the text is something that we will want to change between each instance. Uh, most of the other properties will probably be the same for all instances. They'll all have the same colour or all have the same uh, font. It would be helpful if we had a simpler way to change uh, the text of each one uh, than having to go through the key path. We can create our own variables inside the code, so this is something that uh, you would typically get a developer to do. Up until this point, uh, a designer could do everything I've done uh, with some training. The designer's created all of the uh, layout and color and so on, and now needs a bit of engineering. So the developer comes along and creates a variable called text, but it's not linked in any way to the text label. So let's put in some code that will link those two together. So we can define in Swift, we can define that when somebody tries to get the text uh, property that we've just created, it will actually return the text labels text. And also when something tries to set the text, it will pass on that new value and that can be accessed through code. But it would be great if we could access this new variable that we've created uh, directly in Interface Builder as something that the designer could uh, enter directly. And in order to do that, all we have to do is add the uh, text before the variable called at IB inspectable. Then when we select an instance of a notice view, uh, we get this new variable appearing in the attributes. You can see in the top right hand corner, we've got notice view now appearing as a uh, class section for our uh, particular Lego block for our custom view and it is showing the variable called text that we defined inside our code. The designer or anyone can now simply type in uh, some text here, for instance I've typed in nearest ATM and it appears in exactly the same way as it did when we defined the key path runtime attribute. Now we could go ahead and create the same type of variable for detail text and for uh, the icon. Um, but because this is so common, because we commonly have components that have a text, a detailed text, an icon, and perhaps something like a separator, or maybe an accessory view, uh, we've actually got a superclass already that defines all of these. So let's change this superclass from nib view to nib cell view. And if we have a look at nib cell view, you can see it's already got the uh, IB inspectable text, detailed text, and so on. And if we go back to our class, we can now delete all of this code. As you can see in the top right hand uh, corner now in the attributes, nib cell view presents uh, IB inspectable variables for the text, the detailed text, whether it should show the accessory and whether it should show a separator if, if they're available in this particular view. In many of the projects that I work on, uh, we actually use um, vector drawings driven by paint code uh, 
uh, instead of images. So if we want to, we can take it a step further and change this class to a draw nib cell view and that adds even more IB inspectable properties. Here you can see the icon name and icon style kit. If we enter those, it will look up the relevant uh, drawing from the paint code style kit file. But that isn't required for any of this to work. That's just an example of how you could extend it even further if you needed to for your own resources. Let's apply some styling to our notice view. I've already removed the background colors. I'll go and select the icon view and enter some uh, a style kit and a name of a drawing that's going to be drawn from paint code. Uh, and we'll change the mode to aspect fit so that it keeps its proportions. Now as for the labels, we've got uh, our own class in this project called a styled label. So we'll change that class, pop up the menu in the identity inspector, and that gives us a few other um, IB inspectable attributes, one of which is level. So we've defined uh, text as being any one of levels 1 through 8 and as you can see there we've also got light shade and auto shade uh, that automatically color this text according to the background so if it's on a dark background it will color it light. Let's apply some style to these buttons so at the moment they're just generic UI buttons we'll change their class in the identity inspector to styled button but when you do your own uh, subclass of button you need to in the attributes inspector change the type from system to custom if you want the full uh, customization of your code to take effect so here we've got our two buttons I'm going to change one of the buttons to uh, have a style of one and style one gives us uh, this secondary appearance as you can see, these styled buttons are much larger than the default UI button. Uh, they have their own information about their intrinsic size and how wide they should be, which in this case is too wide for uh, this particular view. So we need to apply some other constraints to make sure that these buttons never extend beyond the edge. So we can select the button group by holding down shift and control on the keyboard and clicking, and then we can select any object in that hierarchy. We select the button group, uh, we'll give it a, a constraint on the left hand side um, of zero to the margin and we'll select that constraint and make it greater than or equal to. So it is allowed to be smaller than the encompassing view but not greater. And if we update the frames we can see that take effect. Let's have a look back at our storyboard at how that looks for each instance. We can customize the content of the second notice view by entering some detailed text and we can change the uh, name of the icon to be something that resembles an ATM. We'll also customize the icon that appears in the welcome notice view. The welcome notice view is still getting its text uh, from the key path dot syntax so I'm going to change that to be uh, the just the variables that we created as IB inspectable uh, variables in the class file and when I do that and switch back to the attributes inspector you can see that they're now populated so I have two instances of the notice view in the storyboard on the left but I can see that the text isn't quite in the right position so in the nib view on the right I'm going to change the constraints so the bottom of the text label will be aligned to the vertical center of the super view. Uh, and now I just need to wake up the storyboard. The text re-renders in the correct position according to the change in the zip. Let's finish off the carousel. We implemented that as a collection view controller that sits inside a container, but there's currently no code that tells it how to behave in terms of how the page control should link up to show the right number of pages in advance. We've actually got a class to take care of that for us that's called a carousel view controller. So we'll go in and change the collection view controller to be a carousel view controller. And then all that remains is for us to enter uh, some of these IB inspectable properties, which is the identifier for each cell, so that we can tell it in what order we want the cells to appear. So first of all, we have to uh, select a cell, holding down Shift and Control, select the cell, 
and give it an identifier, a unique identifier. So we'll call this one welcome and we'll select the next one and I can also select it in the document hierarchy on the left and we'll call this one ATM finder. So now each of the cells in our carousel has its own identifier and in the carousel view controller we can specify the order in which they should appear. We could repeat one if we wanted to. The buttons in our six pack are still the generic UI buttons. So I've prepared earlier a, um, a class called a dashboard tile button and here's the layout in the zib on the right hand side. I've already set up the class for that. So I'll select all of these buttons and go into the identity inspector and change the, um, the type to custom and change the class to be dashboard tile button. As soon as I do that it uses the zib as the source of truth. Uh, I've already entered in the icon name for each of the buttons and this particular button has a special um, boolean property called show badge and you can see there that as soon as I turn on show badge for the tap and pay button then the new badge appears and I could select any button and turn that on. So that's a very neat way for uh, a developer to uh, customize a particular Lego component that a designer can put ad hoc in their uh, layout and simply turn on a boolean attribute to show uh, a badge or some kind of accessory. What we typically do with this is put it into uh, prototype testing with customers. Um, we haven't written any code for controller information here. This is just purely um, yeah, interface at this point. But because the developer's been involved in the engineering, once we get the components from the designer, all of the view stuff's already done. In case you're interested, the particular component that we used to do that was called a nib view. Uh, and it's part of BFW Controls, which is open source. Uh, and a few people asked me about paint code, so I also added mention there about um, the paint code library that we use. Um, now, currently, uh, there are just a few contributors. Uh, so if you're interested in this stuff, please contribute to it. And there's no documentation. So I'll work on that. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, so the question is, putting all this investment in up front to make your views IB inspectable and IB designable, does it pay off in the long run? My short answer is yes, because it makes you design better MVC components. Typically, if I give a developer uh, the spec that I just showed you to say, I'll build a carousel here, build some buttons here, what I'll get back is a view controller with a pile of code. Right? MVC doesn't stand for massive view controller, except in the real world, and that's what happens. Right? Now, the particular product I just produced there had zero view controller code. They're all truly reusable, and I've found many situations where pure, just giving the designer something that is um, well thought out and well engineered, not just for the designer point of view, but for an engineering point of view, they do things I never thought of. So there are all sorts of benefits in just building better components in that way. And IB inspectable and IB designable just kind of make you do it. So yeah, I would say that there's definitely a plus overall. Now, well, since I've got a tiny bit of three minutes, I'll just show you a couple of other examples. At Optus, um, we've been working feverishly on a new app. Uh, and the entire interface has been redone uh, using components. And so, for instance, your usage data is created using something like this that has a donut slice of your usage. And you can see there that we have IB inspectable properties of animation, duration cycles. The code for that has IB inspectable properties. It gets its colours from paint code and it all gets assembled into another component that looks like this. Another example here is a social app that I've worked on. They wanted a custom alert view. And so again, we build IB outlets to each of the items there, each of the buttons, each of the text and so on. And you can see down the bottom there, there's a can cancel bool, right? So it's an IB inspectable bool that the designer or whoever can just turn on or off as to whether to, whether to show the cancel button. And what it does is deactivates a constraint. And that particular constraint, just purely in the IB inspect, in the um, in interface builder, means that the OK button will go full width. So it looks something like this. Sorry. We drag in a UI view. 
you'll see there we're doing the six things. We've got IB outlets already connected. We're setting up auto layout constraints. As soon as we change the class, the thing just draws itself. Okay, that's IB designable kicking in. Now I go into the IB inspectables there. Uh, I put in the title, I can put in the message, and that will just appear immediately. So I get immediate feedback as to whether my constraints are right, whether it overflows off the edge or not. I don't have to run the whole app. And the designer can do that too. And it becomes the designer's problem, which is fantastic, because otherwise you waste a lot of time sort of back and forth. All right, I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.